And we can defeat these things and get rid of all of these things. Amen. A house, a physical house is just like your body. Your body is also a physical house made of flesh and bone. But uh, ministry is not any different for a house than it is for a body. It's just kicking things out. Amen. Kicking things out that people accumulate over time. So, hallelujah. Some of you are really into it today. Amen. And then guys like me who have our costume 24-7 every day of the year. Amen. I'm more spooky than you. Anyway. <laughs> it's good. As long as the kids understand that it's all fun and games and it's not, not, you know, it's not, we don't believe in getting scared or fear. I mean, because that's easy to do, to get scared with your five senses plus the sixth one in the middle of your frontal lobe. Um, you can get scared really easily, but we're here and we can get rid of those things. I understand everybody has stuff they believe in, but for us, eh. you know that um, there's a heightened uh, awareness of these kind of things always in October because of these things. And the Catholics always believe November 1st, you know, feast day of all saints, right? So hallelujah. So, the, the Catholic Church tried to flip it over years and years ago. So today is all saints day. You're all saints. Amen. Either a saint or an ain't. Anyway, <clears throat> this one, well, some preachers say, you say hallelujah. We, we are all that and two bags of chips and cookies and candies and that whole table. Oh, my God, what's going on over there? Anyway, <laughs> amazingness, yeah. Well, feel free. Some of you are already eating cupcakes and whatever. Go ahead. Thank God for the cleaning crew. All right. But... Today, you know, the Lord has been uh, working with me on some stuff that maybe we can uh, get you everything that the enemy has saw fit to take away from your family tree. Um, one thing is for sure, as we continue in this vein of mindset and trees, amen, you know, because Adam ate of a tree, we became like trees. We become rooted to things. We become stuck. Our branches grow. And then... You know, in any tree, there's all kinds of birds and different insects and they make their home in this tree. And that's kind of what the Lord has been showing me, sickness, illness, disease, uh, fly buyers, you know, like birds. They come, they nest, they stay a while. Um, these birds nesting in the trees, I mean, you know, are like thoughts that come to us and sometimes they stay and make their home there for a long time. But they're not a permanent dweller. Everything has a time span, right? A time limit. Uh, including our flesh and bone. So I guess our message here at Crossland is to try and get you to realize that life is so short. Don't dwell on your yesterday and don't even, ah, oh boy, this is a tough one, man. For, you know, forecast your future based on yesterday. I think if you can understand, we don't, we're not who we're going to be because we're not who we were. All right, we are who we are today. So today we're calling this gain again. We'll gain again. Hallelujah. Because we're trying to get you to realize everything you have. All right. Yeah, we all suffered loss. So how do we, when we say restoration or regaining, let me just share this with you. There are people on the other side of the veil who are praying for you every single day. Everybody agree with that? The great cloud of witnesses, they make intercession for us day and night before the throne of God. I want you to realize that. Those former earth dwellings who are now heavenly beings, hallelujah, they never knew they were heavenly beings here on earth. So for us, we are heavenly beings here on earth. Why? Because we understand the Holy of Holies and we understand that everything that they lost or what they view as they squandered or maybe even saying the enemy stole it. How I many you know that they are over there praying that our family tree will regain and be restored based on their intercession. So all of us in here, you know what the enemy is trying to program you to be? Uh, a victim. He's trying to get you to be a victim. Because a victim will either do one of two things. They'll hold on to their past hurts or they never progress forward because of those past hurts. So we want you to regain, we want you to restore everything that your family tree all the way back to the garden has lost can come to you now. Uh, there's a, and if you've been a Pentecostal for a long time, there's a lot of thinking and uh, theology about uh, end time wealth transfers. A lot of churches are believing God for the end time wealth 
transfer. While the end times began when Jesus said it is finished, that wealth transfer will also have already taken place. And if it hasn't, then the enemy has built up mindsets in your family tree to keep it from you. So let's be open-minded today. Amen. You guys do know there's six senses, right? The five in your body and one in your head. All right. So the enemy wants to plague every one of those areas to try and stop you or look at him. You know the enemy, he has no problem with you blaming him. Because he knows that if your focus is on him, you're glorifying him through blame. He knows that blame and shame make you lame. And if he can get you to be that kind of person, how do you know that your focus is never on what God has restored? It's always on what is lost. So we're going to try and uh, get your mindset to wrap around this message today. And all of the scriptures except for one are in the Old Testament. So, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, so if you're reading, can we blow that up so everybody can read that a little bit? I don't know. Just a little bit. Yeah, I'd right, like that. Okay, you guys see that? Everybody reading together? Some of you are so busy about those cupcakes and candies. Hallelujah. You should be awake then today, right? Do the sugar rush. Okay. All right, read with me. Situations, they blind us. All right? Sometimes we forget that whatever the enemy has taken from us can be restored. Everybody say restored. Because you're a storehouse. If it's out of your life, well, you know that it has to be restored. It has to be brought back. All right? Reading the Word of God and understanding it, which is the Word of God. I mean, you can't just read the Bible. You have to have understanding because in Proverbs it says, in all you're getting, get understanding. Amen? You got to understand how the enemy operates. All right? Understanding it is one of the most powerful things we can do. And resting in what the Word says can bring about great, and here's a good word, regain. All right. A lot of people are trying to gain things. I'm trying to get uh, the body of Christ to realize that we can regain because there was nothing lost at the cross. Amen. Now, what, how does he do this? Shame. You guys see it? Shame is the main thing that stops us from moving ahead. Shame. Ah, oh, hallelujah. God's belief in who we are means we don't have to be ashamed. The only thing the devil ever tried to do with the church, read that, was to what? was to get it to feel the shame that Jesus already paid. See, if Jesus paid for shame, then why are we so ashamed of different things? Think about it. It's a trick. It's always a trick. This is a perfect message for the day of trickery, right? Because all the costumes and everything are meant to trick people. And You know what I mean? Uh, trying to get people to believe that you are. Like little kids, when they put on a Batman or a Supergirl or Wonder Woman, they actually believe they are that. But you've put on Christ, and you can't remove this costume because it's not really a costume. It's a reality. You are in Christ. Who are you? I am Christ-like. You can say Christian, but Christian always means that I'm working to be like Christ. Christ-like means you're emulating who he was and who he really is, all right? All right, so he's trying to get the church to feel the shame that Jesus already paid. It never matters the circumstances. It's all... It, it's God's will. You everybody know what God's will is? It's this, to bring everything back to his original intent in, in the garden dwellers. Well, you know, Adam and Eve were the garden dwellers. They were the only two. What happened? Well, they were deceived. They were tricked into a false identity. Once they got on, and you guys remember when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That gave them a false identity. They thought that they were missing something. You see, how do you know that? The garden, there was nothing missing. Nothing was broken. God gave them one little commandment. Don't eat of this tree. All right? And what did they do? They ate, of the, they ate or partake of that tree. And they became like that tree. They became a tree of knowledge. Um, but the knowledge they gained was of good and evil. They were never supposed to know evil. And for you... <laughs> As a finished work Christian, how many know that you are never supposed to look at evil? Hallelujah. you get something today, I'm sure. I, I can stop right now. You probably got something. I hope you got something just by that. All right, so we're going to go down. And this is a bunch of scriptures if you're taking notes. Amen. All right. Restoration or regaining. 
brings joy. Jo- uh, you guys know what joy is? You can't buy it at any store, obviously. Joy comes from knowing who you are and where you're seated. Okay? So if the joy of the Lord is your strength, whose strength is it that you are planted in? The joy of the Lord. Hello. <laughs> So it's not something you chase after. It's something you already have. You just have to let it out of you. Okay. I know it's hard. It's hard. The hardest thing you ever have to do is unravel all the old things that have been done to you and taught you. And try and run with this brand new revelation, which is not really brand new, by the way. It's always been there. Okay. God will reestablish what the enemy stole or destroyed. That's it. Hallelujah. And he already has. The beginnings of it were already given to you at the finished work or the finish line of Jesus' death. At his resurrection now, he left you with the Holy Spirit. You have nothing missing and nothing broken now. But what is the trickery of the enemy? To get you to always blame, be shame, and ultimately never realize who you really are in Christ. Amen? All right. Uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 17. And you can read the scripture as she pumps it up there. Amen. It says here, and this is God speaking through prophets. So as you read, just read it like that, Jeremiah the prophet. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds. Now the wounds it's talking about is your past, your past thought processes, past things that were done to you. Who will do it? God. And he already gave you the, the beginnings of greatness. As soon as you became a Christian, how many know that he already gave you everything you need as far as restoration and regaining. Okay? He gave it all to you. I will restore to you health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. This is what the enemy tries to do through shame. He tries to get you to be outside of something you are already inside of. Amen. It's like a pumpkin, right? We carve out the pumpkin, and what, do, what should we be doing? Now, I know all of us local people, we eat pumpkin seed. Amen. You also eat pumpkin pie. Hey Amen. Well, you know that most people in the mainland, they just gut out a pumpkin and throw it all away? Oh, brah. Come on. I was in, uh, in fact, this last trip in Dallas, somebody gave me pumpkin seeds with garlic salt on it. Hallelujah. Anyway. A pumpkin is still a pumpkin until you make it spooky or whatever you do with it. And then it becomes what? It's still a pumpkin. It's still a jack-o'-lantern. Yeah? So what is the enemy trying to get you to do? He's trying to give you an image of who he thinks you should be. But yet you're still a pumpkin with all the goodness inside. Amen? Oh, boy. Anyway. Outcasts, how many know that all of us in this room, look around this room. The only reason you're in this room and you don't fit anywhere else, is because you were considered in your mind an outcast. You don't fit in. You're that puzzle piece that doesn't fit into any other church. I know I didn't. I tried a couple of different churches, and I did not fit in. You know why? Because I always knew there was something better, a message that was better, a stronger message, something that made more sense. Because everything, I'm, I'm a real analyst. Okay. When I sit in those seats and listen to people speak, I'm looking for life, not death. Because if Jesus is life, and they say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, how come they always got to preach to us about we lost our way? And all about the falsehoods of the enemy instead of the truth in Jesus. Amen? And life, they're always preaching death. The law of sin and death. They're always preaching those things. But Jesus is, he said, I am that's a definition of fact. I am the way. How do you know that in Jesus, you don't lose your way? Right? The truth, you will never be deceived if you know the truth. Because the truth shall set you free. Amen? So you can't be put back in the body. And the life. So you can never ever get death if you are in Christ Jesus. So why are they preaching about hell? See, nobody has that answer. I, I don't know. Mental confusion, probably. You see, they talk so much about the devil, they forget about Jesus. And Jesus is the byproduct because it's talking so much about the law of sin and death and hell and the devil that, oh, by the way, Jesus. Jesus should be the focal point of every message. Your victory should be first, not what you're trying to get. He gave you victory at the cross. He didn't give you defeat. The enemy likes you to think that 
Jesus was defeated at the cross. But no. Remember, there's three crosses. There's three monkeys hanging there. And the main monkey has given us all our monkeyhood back. <laughs> you know, monkey is a term of endearment now. Yeah, It's not like oh, calling Jesus. No. Everybody likes a little funny, curious George kind of monkey. Right? See? How many know that we are curious by nature because of our minds? Right? All of you in here have dabbled and sampled everything in life because you were curious. Say amen. I'm looking at a room full of experience. Not a room full of defeat. Don't ever think that you're defeated. You have more experience than everybody else in this city. And everybody you know and hung out with has way more experience too. They're just waiting for you to get it together so they can follow you in here. Say amen. Come on. Because you were the leader of your pack. And don't even lie to me because I hear people say, Hey, so-and-so go to your church. I go, yeah, they go, whoo, if they can change, I can change. That means you were the leader. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So you guys like that? I will restore to you. This is a prophetic statement that was made how many know that at the finished work of christ all the prophecies in the old testament became our present day truth and reality he has restored to you your health and he has healed your wounds you just have to realize that he already has now i love when christians say god never gives us anything we cannot handle and in the next sentence they say please pray for me right now Okay, if he gives you anything, anything in life that you can handle, how many know it says that you can handle? Uh, I'm more than happy to pray with you, and I do every service, right? I mean, you know that these are all statements of victory. We're not in pursuit of the glory of God. We are the glory of God because we are seated where? In the middle of the glory of God. You saw it when you walked in here. The glory of God was in this place. All the smoke alarms in the building went off. This is what Pentecostals are chasing. You know, if you set off a fog machine in any other Pentecostal church, it would be like on their knees thanking God for that. In here, I'm walking back and forth hoping they better not blame me. They better not blame me. It was just fog. It was ultimately it falls on me, right? So, hey, look, even if they walked in right now, what are they going to see? The glory of God without the fog. How many know that you are the glory of God? When you walk into a room, you are the glory of God. You're not looking for the glory. When somebody asks you for prayer, that's because they believe that your prayer will change them instantly. Nobody has ever asked you for prayer because they thought maybe, hopefully, prayerfully, we can get my situation. No, they know you have the answer. You know why? Once, you know the power of a transformed life? Everybody knows the power of a transformed life. The enemy is going to try and get you to realize you don't have transformation. All right? See, we always look at things in the five sense world plus the mindset, number six. Oh, you know, we look at a transformer, it blows. We're like, oh, lights out. That's me as a Christian. My transformer blew out. It exploded. Now I'm nothing. I'm a wretch. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Some people still believe they're a wretch. But the, the beauty of amazing grace is it saved a wretch. You're not a wretch anymore. You're a saved person. Hallelujah. All right. Oh, boy. All my ranting. Do you get it, though? Am I wasting my breath? Am I preaching to the choir, they say? Oh. Most churches, they use that statement. Oh, I'm just preaching to the choir, but the choir still don't get it. That's why you're preaching. Amen. I, I pray that you never look at me as a preacher. I pray you always look at me as a reacher. That I'm reaching deep inside of that skull and looking for the walnut that you stored up there. The squirrel came and, all right, crack your nut. All right. I will restore to you, the Bible says. Here's a good statement. Always believe that God wants restoration for us. That's why Jesus paid for it. You got to realize that he always wants that. We don't have to settle for sickness even. You know the worst kind of sickness in a Christian is mental sickness? Because you are all that and then you still... It's like going to the doctor and saying, Doctor, I have all these symptoms. And he look at you and go, you got me. Um, 
Bro, the paper on the wall says that you know. Right? Well, you know that if you went to the plumber, he said, oh, my, pl- my plumbing, oh, boss, my toilet explodes. He'll like, whoo, you got me on this one. Oh, you know that when you play the ignorance game, it costs you money. Because if a doctor says he don't know, are you ever going back to that doctor again? No, it's going to cost him money. If a plumber doesn't know what's wrong with your plumbing, are you ever going to call that plumber again? No, it's going to cost him money. As a Christian, you better know your goods and services. Because it will bring you great gain besides money. Everything is provided for. Amen. I hope you get something today. Amen. That's my hope always. Amen. Read this number two out loud. The first two words. What does it say? Never fear. Never fear. Never fear. You know, people always ask me, oh, you went to, the, to that house. Oh, that place. Oogie. Yeah. <laughs> but if I go in there like, oh, Lord, I don't know about this one. Lord, help me. Please, please, please go before me. If I pray, statements like, send the angels before me. How do you know that? The angels are less than me. Why am I going to send somebody less than me in to do my dirty work? When I go in there, it's like it's already clean. As soon as I walk in, it's done. Amen. All right. Never fear, but be glad and rejoice. Because God will do great things. He has given you the former rain moderately, the word says. All right. And now he will give you the former and latter rains. There were two seasons when you know, back in the Middle East, they have two rainy seasons, right? One, right before they're about to plant, they know by the skies that as soon as it rains, it gets the ground ready. They plant their seeds in there, and then they go through the season from spring all the way through summer. And then at the latter end, it rains one more time to give an explosion to all the fruit, all the vegetation they need. And then after that explosion, how many know that that's when the fullness comes in? That's when they harvest because winter is going to come after that. I mean, know that God has given you this, but he's also going to give you both all at the same time. So when you plant your seeds in here, just realize that there is no season other than a season. Maybe of about, it all depends on what you're sowing for. Now, if you're out here walking around with two different color slippers praying for a brand new car, it's going to take you a little while to wrap your head around owning a car. You know what I mean? Because he's so used to the footmobile. Then it's going to be a, a season that you got to walk through of growth. Amen? Because I've had people walk in here with two different color slippers and tell me, Pastor, I'm praying for a Ferrari. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I, I'm like, you know, it takes everything within me to, to shut down my mental sickness. <laughs> this, happened to, this happened to me. I'm telling you, this happened to me in a service in the mainland. Okay? This guy came in and said, I'm believing God for a Ferrari. I was like, okay, this guy never have two different colors. He had two different shoes on. And I was looking at him. I said, you really believe that? He says, amen. He said, you know. And I preached a message similar to this about restoration, you know, about bringing in past losses and stuff. And you know this guy? I had no idea that this guy that looked so disheveled and homeless was actually in line for an inheritance. I didn't know. After we prayed, he put one dollar, the last dollar he had, he put it in a basket. Everybody came up and gave him money to sustain him through a season. And I asked him after when I ran into him way later, I asked him, what did you do with all that seed that they gave you at that service? He said, I began systematically planting. And he says, you know what the problem was? My parents had died. My grandparents had died. I didn't know where to look or where to go. Because, how I mean, you know, a lawyer was looking for him. He didn't know. And he didn't know where to go. He systematically began planting. And lo and behold, he was in a church service somewhere uh, in California. And he was up planting a seed. And the pastor had asked him, hey, can you come and give us that testimony that happened to you? And he came up and he told a story. And a guy was sitting in the service from his hometown. Didn't know him, but knew the attorneys were looking for him. Saw an ad in the paper, we're looking for so-and-so. Found him in the middle of church. How do we know that God will find you here? He found you out there. Don't go back out there. Some of you take long pauses in your Christianity. You better knock it off. Because there's, there's a great wisdom in every service. Amen. 
Well, this guy, he was in line and he inherited approximately $12 million. And he said, well, what's funny is all the money he had gained was $1,200 from that service. You guys remember? $1,200. And he began sowing it. And he never ate his seed. Everybody said, uh, I'll never eat my seed. Because your, your seed will always guarantee your needs are met. So he never ate from that. But he noticed that that 1200 that he had saved from that ch church service, he had begun giving. Okay? Six months. Okay? Six months. 1200 divided by six was how much? That's what he was giving. Every service was $50 out of that. $50 and just trusting God. And they found him right as he planted the last seed. And he came up to give his testimony. The attorney approached him. Uh, the attorney's friend or family member approached him after the service. And said, you're so-and-so. They've been looking for you. How I mean, you know that last seed had to go in the ground? I'm telling you, this might be the last seed of the greatest harvest you ever experienced in your life. Did you participate? This is not a compulsion sermon trying to get you to give. You should already be giving because you're a giver by nature. All of you gave away all your stuff. Tell the truth. No, all of you gave away stuff in your life, right? Nobody stole it from you. You gave it away willingly. In fact, many of you in here gave away your drugs too. You share powerfully. Well, now you got to change that mentality over to Christianity. What is it that you can give away now? How about parts of your heart? Sometimes you give away parts of your heart. Sometimes you got to give love where there is no love. You got to love the unlovable. Amen. There's always somebody you know that everybody thinks is weird or strange. But they're your friend. Why? Because you love them. Amen. So this guy, he, out of his $1,200 in seed, he always, people always gave him, gave him money, but he never touched that $1,200, except he said this was earmarked as seed just for God. $12 million tax-free. Amen. And I've been waiting for my 10% ever since. Hallelujah. <laughs> Cannot find them. Shucks. Anyway, <clears throat> he going to find me. Amen. I believe that. He's going to find me. Okay. Never fear, again, God will do great things, okay? The floors of your life. How many know that you have stacking systems in your life? Some for now, some for later. How many know that many of you have provision for your whole life? You just don't know it. God has been providing for you. Even when you say, whoa, I don't know where it came from, it always shows up on time. I don't know where it's coming from, it shows up on time. I don't know who's going to bring them, it shows up on time. You have never been without. Look at yourselves. I don't see any of you. Looking like you're from uh, Africa. Anyway, you are all healthy. You're all good. Amen. You just got to be more strategic with the seeds that are coming into you through your paycheck or your assistance or whatever. You can start off on assistance and never, never ever need assistance ever again. You will be assistance to everybody else. You got to start someplace. Amen. Everybody starts from a someplace. Hallelujah. Uh, if we would eliminate the word some, we would have all. Some place, something, someone, somewhere. So take away the word some and see what happens to your life. Amen? Your floors will be full of wheat and the vats will overflow with wine and oil. You will have plenty and praise God. Uh, his people will never be ashamed. Look at Joel. Uh, that's how it's pronounced. It's not Joel, only in America. Joel. Joel, 22, 21 to 26. Fear not, O land. How many know that you are a land? Say amen. Be glad and rejoice for the Lord has done. Now this is Old Testament. He has done marvelous things. All right. Don't be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up and the tree bears its fruit. All right. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has... He has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors will, shall be full of wheat, and the vats will overflow. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust. You guys know what that means? The stuff that comes to pick apart from your life. You have all experienced this. 
Amen. People have come to take little pieces out of you. Mm, yeah. So he will restore to you those, the crawling, the consuming, and the chewing locusts. There's four different kinds of locusts. You look at your life. There's four different kinds of episodes in your life. Amen. A lot of it has to do with mindset. All right. Just look at those four words, swarming, crawling, consuming, and chewing. Those four demonic spirits are always active in your life, trying to take pieces out of you. But God, in the first verse we had, in verse 21, said he will restore that to you. No matter what was taken. How many know that you represent your entire family tree past? So everything they lost is yours to pick up. So remember, these four things have chewed away, have swarmed away, have taken, they've consumed, they've chewed, they've crawled, they've taken stuff out of your family. How many know that you're here to get it all back? The only thing that stops you guys, well, I'm not going to say the only thing, but one of the only things that stops you is fear. Fear and pride. Hmm. Hallelujah. You see, we got to get out of the time machine. Hallelujah. All of us are living in a time machine. And you know the time machine you're living in right now? Let me just tell you this. It's a repeat of what your family went through maybe two, three, four hundred years ago. It, the same episodes have to keep happening because the enemy doesn't know any other way to attack, swarm, consume your family tree except by these devices in your family tree. So you got to be the person that takes away all of that and says no more. No more. I'm going to regain everything. Once you realize you're seated position, that's the beginnings of greatness. Don't say, yes, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that heavenly place, you know what the heavenly place represents? Your mindset. You cannot say, I'm seated in my old mindset in heavenly place. No, you can't do that. It's a whole brand new existence. Some of you are going to hear me today. Some of you are not. You're just going to prolong your harvest. But if you get what I'm saying, I can tell you right now, your whole life can change with one word. One word. One sermon. One episode. You're here today not by accident. There's a lot of people that texted me this morning, not going to make it today. You know that that's a statement of fact for the rest of your life? Not going to make it today? Which day are you going to make it? It's not about attendance. It's about wisdom, knowledge, revelation, understanding. When are you going to finally make it? Hallelujah. You know that one sermon that you missed because the enemy tricked you could be the one that you needed, needed to change the entire destiny of your whole family? I'm not here to lecture you. I'm lecturing myself. Remember, I don't even see you. I'm preaching to me. I always preach to me. Amen? Because I got to get it before I pass it on. So if I get it same time as you, we all graduate together. Amen? You know how it is. We cheat off each other. I don't care how well you study the subject matter. If you think that somebody got a better answer, you will copy. You know, I'll tell you a little secret. There's a lot of cops that are now approaching retirement age that took the police test when I took it years ago. They used to all pay me $200 just to sit around me. Because they knew I had all the answers, right? And I used to always take a test. If I'm taking a police test, I'm going to take it like I'm already a cop. And I used to take the test. And you know my friend? This is my friend. The first time he took the test, he gave me $200. After, after he got his results, he wanted his money back. I said, why? I, he said, I can copy you exactly every single one. And I got, I, I never even chart. He said, I think I got 20%. I said, how can I get 97 and you get 20? I said, somewhere along the line, you can copy wrong because everybody around me had 97. Except Joel Lolo. You know what he did? He missed the first one. Everyone after that was wrong. He wanted his money back. I said, you know what? I'll take it again just for you, you banana. And you know what? He scored exactly the same. Hallelujah. You know what? Some people just aren't geared for tests. And that's why ministry is so beautiful. Because all of you in here have passed various kinds of tests in your life. 
But the ultimate test is still every day, getting through today. Because you cannot look at yesterday, you cannot look at tomorrow. You got to look at today. Jesus said, today. What is today? Some of you are brilliant. Sunday, right now. Hallelujah. I'm in a room full of genius. Amen. Well, whatever you deem today to be, how many know that you could be, you know that you go second by second as a brand new day? Because if something happened five minutes ago, that's already Paul. Hallelujah. All right, so look at these four. Swarming, crawling, consuming, and chewing. These can attack your body. They can attack your mind. They can attack your finances. They can attack your family. They can attack your job. You got to be. Now, I took a test as if I was already a policeman. All right? How about this? I'm already a disciple of Christ. I'm already a spiritual son of the Most High God. I am already seated in heavenly places. I got to behave from that standpoint. Not hoping to get it. Not trying to get it. I already got it. So I got to behave as if I already get it. Uh, if you're taking notes, Romans 4.17 is beautiful. And we talk about it all the time in here. Calling those things that are not as though they were. Meaning, I'm going to call my life as if I was already what I'm desiring. If you don't understand how riches work, just call yourself rich. And then don't fill your head with any other thought. I like reading biographies because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guy that likes to study other people's lives. And you know what I found? I, I've studied everybody's life. Yeah, Steve Jobs, Paul Allen, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Donald Trump even. I've read all their biographies. And you know what I find? All of them had gr- some of the greatest failures in the history of the earth. But the one thing is they never gave up because they believed in who they were. You're talking about guys that... Never even graduate college, some of them. They quit. They quit. It wasn't for them. You know, some of the greatest college graduates, you're using their products every day. Bill Gates, number one. Richest man on the planet. How many of you use Microsoft every day? Some of you like, well, how many know that Microsoft and Apple were created at the same time? Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were bouncing things off of each other. Steve Jobs is another one. Working out of a garage... Never stop believing in who he was. You can take any of these guys and say, who's brilliant? The one that stays the course. Not the one that went to school. Hallelujah. Some of you went to school. You struggled through. But in real life, you, you succeed. Amen. Some of you did really well in school. And you get into real life, you struggle a little. Why? Because you were more book oriented. Now you got to flip out of that and say, now I'm more goal oriented. All right? We should all have this one goal, that we realize who we are in Christ Jesus. That's it. If you're going to study the Word, always look in the New Testament. Look for the I am or the in Christ. Hallelujah. And you will find great, great possibilities in your life. 26 says, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. <clears throat> now go back again to 25. I want to show you one line right here at the end of verse 25. God said this, I will restore to you the years that all of these locusts. And then that last line in verse 25, what does he say? (laughs) Who sent the army? (laughs) You see, as great as God is, he believes in you more than the enemy that's attacking you. Because God believes that there is nothing that he's just going to leave to you. You have to understand why you're getting it. Why is that thing such a prize to you? Well, you got to go through all of these things to realize that. God sent it to see how well you do. It's like, how many, some of you are military based, right? You went, you went, you did your time in the military. Amen. You go, you go through a thing called basic training you simulate all of the things of war so that when you go into war you're not surprised that's why god calls it here my great army because how many know that god will send it and he wants to see if you pass basic training 
Everything you go through in life is God's attempt to get you to realize that you are fixing something that somebody in your family tree has failed at. It's left to you to pass the test now. You can say, yeah, I'm seated in heavenly place. And when the test comes, oh, my God, I love it. How many know that you're not passing basic training? Basic training happens every single day. There's basics that you've got to get down deep inside of you. I don't care what field of endeavor you choose. It could be the working world. It could be athletics. It could be anything. Your test, you know, even in sports, right? Many of you played sports. What is this thing called you do more of instead of games? It's called practice. You know, all of these things, you know, these four locusts, these four consuming things that are trying. I mean, you know that it's just practice for the real thing, that when the real thing comes, ain't nothing to you. Ain't nothing to you. You got to realize that God will never give you anything you cannot handle. So as you handle this every day, when big things come, you're like, eh, handle. No problem. Amen. You know that you can call those things that are not as though they were as soon as because you realize that I went through all of this. Remember David when he was not the king? He was, he was out in the field tending sheep and he thought to himself, oh, this is irritating to me. Because he would look at his brothers and they would tell him, stay back. You cannot come. You cannot fight with us because you got to go through your own training. He never even realized he was going through training by keeping the sheep safe. Remember, he had a slingshot, and he was whipping it at lions and bears and killing them. How I mean, you know that when the big test came, what happened? He planted a rock in the middle of Goliath's head. Now, the rock didn't kill Goliath. Amen. How I many you know, but courage. You know that Goliath's sword was 150 pounds? This 14 or 15-year-old red-headed, freckle-faced kid had just stunned Goliath and had to pick up the sword and cut his head off to hold it up to show proof because his brother still never believe. <laughs> Amen. Here's another little tidbit of fact that I, I think I said a couple weeks ago that the, the hill where Jesus was crucified is called Golgotha. It's the place of the skull. This is where David planted Goliath's skull in the middle of the hill. He showed the army of Israel and the Philistine army that he had just slain the biggest mindset that ever existed on the earth and planted it in the hill. And when Jesus came, how do you know that? Jesus was crucified, not by accident, on the place of the skull to defeat mindset once and for all. His cross was planted squarely, right in the middle of the skull to defeat mindset forever. Some of you are going to get that someday. Go listen to this sermon over and over. And you will see that your biggest battle that the enemy still tries to bring to your table is the battle of the mind. Hallelujah. And not only did he plant Jesus in the middle of that skull, he put the devil and he put Adam. The spirit of Adam and the spirit of Satan on the same hill with their feet all off the ground. To redeem the curse of mankind. Hallelujah. See, you got to realize your battle is all mental. It's never about physical things. Yeah, you can get up and punch somebody in the face, but what are you going to do? You go in jail, and then you got to call somebody for bail. Then you got to go through court. Then you got to go through community service. And you got to go through all these things. When all you got to realize is the last line, my great army which I sent among you, all it is is for basic training. Some Lolo says, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, Bible. Well, that's cute. Well, you know, your greatest teacher is experience. Miss Lomi, Lomi, Lomi. Get plenty but she no experience me anyway. Oh, you know, the enemy would love to experience you. And you know, here's the beauty of it. All of these demonic things that are on this earth, remember this. God has sent them so you pass the test. Oh, my God. That's great preaching. All of you all silent. If I was in a black church, they'd be running back and forth, screaming, jumping, jumping over the furniture, high-fiving each other. In here, we're all catatonic, like. 
Sounds good, Pastor. You got to invite them. He, he, just go online and listen. When I was in Chicago, you can hear it. And that's not all black. And in Dallas, a lot of Hispanics, they get excited. Hawaiian lane. That's all. What else? Tell me some more. I'm going to put cattle prods in all that seats. And when I, say something, when I think I say something great, I'm going to just press a button. And you go, hallelujah. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get that word. I know. You can get a whole lot of PH words. Fa, fa, foom. Anyway. Hallelujah. But the good part, you know, you look at it. My great army to send among you. And then the next line says, he doesn't put but. He makes a declaration. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. In the, in the midst of all your tests, you're still good. You know why you're still good? Because the only test is in your mind. It's all in your mind. I know all of you in here, you're all emotional eaters. That's why we're all at ease. <laughs> I know Tara was just talking to Tara about she removed her tonsils at this stage of her game. Amen. No can eat. She said, but later on when I can swallow, I'm going to catch up. <laughs> Amen. And mustard and mayonnaise and hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. She started already. I saw her like, mm, no. And just suck them longer until the teeth working better. Anyway, I get people like that all the time. That's the for me. I just got new teeth. I'm not going to eat. Oh, but you suck that thing long time, I know this. Uh, see, we all know how to get through. We just got to realize we are getting through. I pray that this message is bringing you life and life more abundantly today. All right? Okay, back to our notes. Hallelujah. You all see that? My great army. So whenever you're going through something, realize that this is God's attempt to show how strong you are in the face of the enemy. Amen. How many of you going through something? Raise your hand. God is taking you right through it, breezing you right through it. And you're like, <laughs> everything's still moving. The earth never stopped turning. <laughs> Did the earth stop? No. Did the day stop? No, did the lightning come and hit you? Should have, but never. <laughs> Amen. Some people say, when it rains, it pours. Of course, because it's raining. <laughs> people like to say, when I go through something, everything else go wrong. Maybe that's all four of those spirits at work at the same time, because God sees that he can trust you to get through it. Remember, God is the one that gives you all of these things. It's not the devil. The devil's defeated at the skull, the place of the skull, Golgotha. Amen. Hallelujah. So you cannot say the devil is testing you. Yeah, if the devil comes, that's fine. But what? You're like, man, manini that one. Only in Hawaii we talk like that, manini. All right. Next here. Always rejoice and be glad, even when nothing seems to be going right in our lives. This is part of supernatural restoration. All the locusts that you're going through, how many of you know that God is trying to get something to you? Don't ever say the devil's trying to take something from you. God's trying to get something to you. Once the mindset button flips on, ping, you're good. The greatest policy you can ever have is when you're getting mad, even if you go to anger management. Which many of you had to do. Anyway, some of the things they teach in anger management is take deep breaths. Take a walk. Clear your mind. Don't say anything. Oh, yeah. Power of escalation. When I was going through basic training to be a corrections officer. By the way, the state does it like this. I went through basic training as a corrections officer four years after I was there. Hallelujah. I learned things on my way out, not on my way in. Anyway, well, one of the greatest things they taught was about the power of escalation, keeping your mouth shut, defusing a situation. Amen. You know what? I tell you right now, the greatest ignition device in the world is your mouth. Your second one is your ears because you say something to get a response because you like do something. Amen. So take a walk, take a breather. Take a smoke break, whatever you do, amen. Just stop and realize this is something that's trying to get me to stop progressing, amen. God forbid one of you punch somebody because what's going to happen next? You might feel good for a second, but with those handcuffs on behind your back, you're going to be wondering, 
Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have listened to Pastor. I took a walk, took a breath, took a cigarette break, took something. But instead, your right hand is throbbing in handcuffs. All right. All right. Demonstration, you see him? All right. The rain the scripture refers to is, everybody reading? The anointing from God. Overflow is the characteristic of this anointing. When he strongly anoints us, we see this overflow. Everybody remember what I, the definition of anointing is? Burden removing, yoke destroying, what? Power of God. So the anointing on your life attracts a lot of tests in your life because God wants to show how great you are. Has God been showing how great you are or have you been showing God how pathetic you are? Just something to think about. You don't have to answer out loud. We don't want to know all your laundry. <laughs> how great is God? We, we will, the word says that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts, not our thoughts. So when he brings a test, we automatically, he wants, you know what God really is testing you to see? If you blame the devil or you glorify him. Your first thing should be whenever a test arrives, what should, what should you do? Praise God. I'll get through this because you brought it to me. You will take it through me. Because somebody in your life, if you suffer through all of these situations, somebody in your family tree failed miserably at it. And here you are. You know that a lot of people tell me, and when I run into people, they tell me, oh, heart attacks run in my family. You know what the first thing comes to my mind? Your family is very angry. So uh, what are my words of advice and encouragement to them? Watch your anger. Take a breath. Take a walk. Hallelujah. Some of you cigarettes. If you don't smoke, don't take a cigarette. No makes sense. In fact, I would prefer all of you not to smoke. My dad died of emphysema and lung cancer. I prefer you not to go out that way. Amen. Take a Snickers. Unless you get high blood sugar, then don't take a Snickers. Okay. Somebody in your family tree failed at the very thing you are going through. Think about that for a second. You can all think about it and say, yep, yeah, just in the generation above you, somebody failed at that. The generation above, surely somebody failed at it. And the ones that you never met, I guarantee you they failed at it. Okay. You good with that explanation? All right. God is trying to do something great and trying to get some great stuff to and through you. You just got to realize what he's trying to get through your family. You all know your family tree because the stories come down. Oh, yeah. Uncle so-and-so, he went prison for killing somebody. Very angry man. And then you go through anger and you're like, I don't know why I'm so angry. What are you, dumb? It's in your family. So you're the redemption factor. Amen. You're the one to redeem the entire family tree. You guys all can see over here? This TV went point the wrong way. Yeah. You guys better now? All right. Okay. You guys all reading? Some of you looking all the way over here from over there. Right there, get one. All right. The anointing. Now, what is the anointing again? Burden removing, yoke destroying, power of God. Removing and destroying. What is God trying to remove and destroy based on your life? He's not trying to remove you. He's not trying to destroy you. He's trying to show how great you are. Whenever you get thoughts, I mean, you know, this is the enemy's attempt to try and short-circuit things. Right? He takes things that God is taking you through and he tries to magnify it even more powerfully. Okay? How I many you know the sun is very powerful? Yeah? Everybody agree with that? But if you put a magnifying glass under it, you can burn ants. Amen. Amen. We know that the enemy is the magnifying glass. God is this. The enemy tries to make it this and turn it evil. Yeah. Hallelujah. For the ant putting, unless it's fire ants. But the ant putting, he's just doing his thing like, oh, why am I burning? Oh. Oh. You feel like the ant under the magnifying glass sometimes. God is not trying to kill you. He's trying to make you stronger. Amen. Oh, there's a rapper that says, what does it kill you make you strong? Anyway, we all know that already. We don't need a rapper to tell us. Okay. Now, 
Supernatural restoration is powerful because God just wants everything in your family has lost to come to you so that you can show how powerful God is. And some of us are like taking the lesser road like, oh, God no love me as much as them. Really? Why you figure that for? Is it because of your mind? I guarantee you it's because of your mind. Okay? We said it already in A, always rejoice. That's a key, by the way. Always rejoice. How many of you can rejoice when you're going through something? I would say maybe 3%. But 100% potential, but 3% active. I rejoice in you, Lord. <gasps> really? And God is like, huh? That's the weirdest rejoicing I ever heard. <laughs> All right. Here we are, right here. Always rejoice. Okay? Supernatural restoration, the rain, the scripture refers to as the anointing. Overflow is the characteristic. When he strongly anoints us, we see the overflow. Amen. Psalm 51, 12 says this exact thing. We don't even have to go there pretty much unless you really want to. Restore to me the joy of salvation. And we know that joy was installed the day you got saved. Powerful joy, right? You guys see it? <clears throat> Verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by what? The Holy Spirit is Generous. You guys know what generosity is? The Holy Spirit will give you everything. He will, he's not going to give it to you. He's just going to revelate you. He's going to reveal to you what you already have. And say, hey, you already got this. You can get through this. It's not a problem. You have it. You just got to realize how to use it. Amen? We all had those Christmas presents we couldn't figure out. You know the most practical Christmas present you ever got was underwear? Because you knew what to do with it. Amen. Everything else, you're going to, okay, I wonder why they gave First, you figure out why they gave you this. Hey, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit is very generous. He just wants to reveal to you how powerful you are. And as you go through these things, how you know that you will understand why you had to go through it. It's always for the benefit of not just the one, the others that have passed through this life, but the others that are coming into your life. You're here for somebody else. Yeah. Amen to you too. <laughs> Hallelujah. She's going to keep going all day. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Next, go back to the notes. And let's see. Let's keep going so you get it all. Okay. Halloween. Ooh. How many of you ever had that chicken skin? The hair on your back of your neck stand up. You're like, oh yeah. Get close. Oh my God. What do you do when you feel that? You can laugh. How about saying, I apply the blood of Jesus to the four posts of my property line in Jesus' name. From the corridors of heaven right through the pit of hell. Blood. The blood of Jesus flows right through this property. I mean, you know, there's no demon that's going to hang out. It done like, ah. Amen. Because what was the redemption? What was the payment for redemption at the cross? Blood. The blood of Jesus. So you speak the blood of Jesus to something. What happens? They're either going to run away or get apprehended by angels who are going to escort them to the pit of hell. If you so say that. Because everything in heaven is done according to your word. How many of you want to rid somebody of cancer? First, you've got to get a willing participant. They've got to be willing to let it go. Then you say, I apply the blood of Jesus to you from the top of your head to the bottom, side to side, corner to corner, front to back. And I command the spirit of cancer to be apprehended by the angels of God who will pull you out and throw you in the pit of hell never to return in Jesus' name. And then fill the hole with the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's worth listening to this sermon all the way again. That's powerful stuff. Amen. I was, I was in a conference one time, and these guys had come to the, to the meeting. I told this story several years ago, and it's been happening over and over. I was at a conference speaking, and these guys, four preachers, walked in late. And they said, Pastor, can we have the mic, please? We have a testimony. I said, if you're going to interrupt me, sure, here you go. 
You know what they say? We were just flying down I-5 in California, and we saw a semi start flipping in front of us. We all applied the blood of Jesus all at the same time. Our car got lifted right over the accident and placed on the other side. I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. Some of you would rather just go through the car wreck and survive. And, but they applied the blood and were spirited over the accident. Went back to help pull the driver out of a burning truck. If it works in that kind of scenario, you don't have to be a preacher, by the way, to apply the blood of Jesus. Amen. Can you apply it to your kids? Yeah. Cannot change their behavior. But a vacancy in spiritual activity may change your child's behavior. Amen. Because your kid's hot head like you. They came from you. They're half you and half the other one. Anyway. <laughs> and I know you guys. Oh, yeah. They like the other one. <laughs> Never you, right? No blame. All right. Restore to me the joy. All right. When we first get born again, we keenly feel the joy of being rescued and accepted as God's beloved. Now, if you're new to the church, that first year is exciting for you. Everything you pray is answered. Everything. And then begins the mind trips. Some people, the second service after they get saved. Some people, two weeks. Some people, two months. Some people, eight months. Some people, nine months, 11 months. That first year, they know it's powerful. Even in Hawaiian culture, if the baby could make it through the first year, you make luau. It's a celebration. Hardest year of life is the first year, right? Uh, we believe that and we understand that. So as a Christian, you got to realize your first year in Christ, everything goes well. Everything's great. The second year, all of a sudden, God says, okay, here's the locust. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's telling all of heaven and all of hell, what's this? They can because I believe they can. And then you're like, ah, ah, I got to so see. I got to pray. Somebody got to pray for me. I got to do something. All of a sudden, ultimately, you're like, no sense, go church already. <laughs> Not working. No, it is working. You just got to give it time. You just got to give it time. All hell is breaking loose because it's never going to return again. Why me? Why not you? The first year, you could do no wrong. You're like, Superman. Hallelujah. I am Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you're left alone. Your costume is tattered. And you're like, what happened? Hallelujah. Oh, boy. All you got to do is do the same things you always did because here's what happens. The locusts get tired of hanging out with you if you are consistent. If you don't change or deviate the plan, they have no business hanging out with you anymore. They don't want to. They're like, no sense. They don't change already. But they'll come from time to time to see. They just like check how you're doing. Like, and God says, go ahead. Check them. All you got to do is study the life of Job. And we'll get to that at the end of these knowns. Job was tested in all ways, but God didn't give permission to the enemy to kill him. But his kids all got killed. I mean, Job still had to go through his pity party. Still had to do all of these things. From chapter 1 and 2 all the way to chapter 42, he laments. He goes through. Oh, yeah, yeah. 42, you'll see at the end of this sermon what happened for Job. Amen. God is good. <laughs> All right. Joy is powerful like dynamite, right? As Christians, we must find our joy. When this is restored, other things in our lives will also be restored. Okay. You guys all good? Okay. Thanks. Always rejoice knowing that restoration comes from the hand of the Lord. Amen. Restoration. When the fig tree will not blossom, there is no fruit, Habakkuk says, and the fields yield nothing. I will still rejoice. God is my strength. That's what it says in Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 19. He is right here. He is, we just read a lot of it, right? Go down. Uh, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice. In the Lord, for or I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God 
is my strength. No matter what you're going through, God is your strength. If he brought you to it, he'll get you through it. Amen? He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. Now, the high hills are, if you're walking on top of the hill, how I many know you're on top of your mindset? Amen? You guys good with that? How are, how are you doing in the mindset game? How are you doing? I know our church will go through way more mindset trips than other churches. You know why? The enemy doesn't see fit to attack them. God has no use to attack them. They're like, no sense. Go ask your other Christian friends. When you get preached a message of mindset, how many know that the enemy is like, okay, let's test them out. He wants to see consistency. God wants to see consistency. Your friends don't get attacked like you. Right? You say, oh, how are you doing? Uh, everything. They're like, oh, it's so good. Church is so good. Praise God. And then they ask you, how are you doing? <sighs> but yet, who's, who's living in the Holy of Holies? Yes. You. Who's in the inner court? Them. More often than not, in our city, all the churches are gravitating towards an outer court message of peace and love. The only thing is like... Oh, praise God. I came to church. Praise God. God is good. The only thing going on is some people looking at me funny, but it's okay. Us? No, people come in after us with knives and hammers and guns. Because I can tell you right now, every one of you represents a ministry or a church in the future. Every one of you. Don't look at this as, oh, I got to come. Yes, this is your church. This is you, but how many of you know that eventually you become a ministry of your own device, what God calls you to be. And then you come back with great testimonies. That's what a church is supposed to do. You are a church that goes out from Monday through Wednesday. Wednesday you come back. Thursday through Saturday you're doing church. Your church is wherever you're at. And you come back here and you say, ha, 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 ha. That message is awesome. You know why? Because I just went through that and was nothing. The devil think he's something. He nothing to me. God, bring it on. Wait. Slow down. Pump your brakes, God. Don't shift, Lord. Compound first, please. No, God not going. You know why? Because you live in the Holy of Holies. He, to whom more is given, the word says, more is expected. Your results are expected. You're supposed to say, nothing. I get them. Going through it. Because the clock doesn't stop ticking. You know what I hate the most? I'm going to be honest with you guys. It's sitting on a plane going someplace. And this is how I get through it. I think of, okay, I got to sit on this plane for six hours, get off for two, get on another one for three. I just sit there and I say, you know what? At the end of all of this, I'm going to be back on this plane coming home. So what I do? I go watch stupid stuff. on. The, I download stuff on my tablet and I watch stupid stuff. You know why? Because it's funny. I figure if a comedy show is 30 minutes, you take away the commercial, it's about 22 minutes. I've gotten this down to a science. If I can watch X amount of shows, then I get through the whole trip. Amen? And then I'm like, oh, I don't want time for, fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Okay. And then the plane lands. Praise God. I'm there. Know what I mean? No matter how badly these people are snoring next to me or whatever, people banging me with the carts, whatever. It's just, I know that I'm going to get through it. Going to get through it. I just got to realize that I will. And I always just say, well, I'm going to get through it. The worst thing you can do is watch, watch the flight tracker on the plane. And look at this thing. And it's not going nowhere. 2,800 more miles. Then look at it. 2,780. 2,750. Turn them off. Watch my own thing. Hallelujah. I have found the trick is drinking lots of Robitussin and then taking sleep aids and Benadryl all at the same time. You blink and you wake up and you're there. Like... And then you got to figure out where you're at. Where am I? Look at the ticket. Hallelujah. God is good. 
Amen. You're going to get through it. It's just a, it's just a course of time you got to get through. Always look at the end and say, at the end, I'm going to be sweet smelling. Nothing bad. I won't even have the stain or stench of smoke on me, even though I go through the fire. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Good. Somebody needs to hear this. Hallelujah. I know me, but who else? All right. Happiness comes from our comfort, but joy comes from what we know. When bad things happen, we can be joyful because we have the God of restoration. This next one, joy is our strength. Everybody say strength. Strength to what? Turn things around. It's closely linked to restoration. Don't despise a thief, Proverbs 6 says, who steals because he's hungry. But the thief who is caught must restore sevenfold. Proverbs 6, verse 30 and 31, as you take a look at this. Amen. People don't despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he's starving. Right? If somebody was hungry, this happened to me when I used to work in retail. I was working at a supermarket right across the street, in fact. Mall food, sure save. And I saw a hungry little girl. She was stealing candy to eat. And then she would run out the store. And I saw that she was sharing with her brother in the car. And the car was pretty much broken down. It was filled up with all kind of stuff in the back. And my job is if I catch a shoplifter, what do you do? just to grab them, have the cops come. Then I would watch the mother trying to pay with her change, and this little girl would keep coming, and I told the little girl, okay, I caught you stealing, but since you're hungry, you're okay. Make sure you take care of somebody. She goes, I am. I'm taking care of my brother, and there's my littlest brother in the car seat. She's giving the little baby chocolate because they don't eat. You know, some kids only get school lunch. Right? That's the only meal they get sometimes. So for that kind of scenario, yeah. But here's the thing for us, right? Hmm. When he is found, he must restore sevenfold. This is us now. Okay? If we, if we get caught thieving or stealing, or whatever, how many know that it's okay to sustain yourself? It's like that. But how many know that later on? And even, this also pertains to the enemy, right? If you catch the enemy stealing from you, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. Now, if the enemy had to give up all the substance of his house, what is sevenfold? How many of you would deem that the enemy has stolen from you a million dollars in the course of your life? Raise your hand if you think it's a million or more. Some of you are like, way more. How many? Well, maybe way less. But flip that over seven times. If it's a million cash, Goods, whatever. One million. One fold would be two million. You guys get it? Three fold would be four. And then eight. What are we at now? Keep going, keep going, keep going. And you will see like, whoa, God's math is way off. (laughs) He makes them pay way more than he got. Are you realizing like... I don't know, what are we up to, 100-something million? Are you there? <clears throat> well, you could be there with just a little shaping of the mind. You know, my son was telling me, oh, Dad, I just, he's had these opportunities to go work in these different jobs, and they pay very well, 70, 80,000. I told him, how come you're not taking these jobs? That's good money. He goes, because I'm waiting for the six figures. He said, and when I get to six figures, I'm looking at seven figures. I like how you think, son. Amen. You know why? Because he's thinking about sustaining himself forever. But in the meantime, he's grateful for what he has, bitching and moaning like crazy about where he's at. But he understands that there's goals that he's setting to get to the next level. How about us? Are we content with what we get? Oh, I hope the union negotiate one good raise this year. Well, that's fine, but how many know that you can bank on God's banking system, which is way more fruitful than any union. All you got to do is be your own union. You don't rely on the union. You are the union. You got to get all the pieces of yourself unified, spirit, soul, and body. 
what's jeopardizing. I can tell you right now, if you don't get all the pieces of yourself on the same page, unified, I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to have all the money in the world, but sick as a dog. Or you have all the health in the world, but poor as anything. Amen? Because the peace is not all together. Wednesday we preached about the wheel of life. You guys remember? Anybody? Anybody? We put some new scriptures in here on the wheel of life. So if you had the old teaching on the wheel of life. Anyway, upgrade. And the service before that, if you missed that, was spirit singularity. Amen. And the one before that was the person and work of the Holy Spirit. The one before that was the lame game of shame. See, all the ones you're missing, some of you, storms are the norm was before that. Kingsdom was before that. Savor the favor before that. Escalating success. Yeah. Any of these ringing true with you or helping you? From critical to stable condition was the one before that. Managed or a mangled mind. Amen. Leaving the... in. Man, I don't know about you, but this is a crash course in, this is beyond your doctorate in life. Just go online and listen. And uh, if you don't agree with what I say, show up more often so you can pay more attention. Because some people just left the church not getting the full understanding of what I was teaching. Because they come once a month and they think they get the whole deal. (laughs) Amen. You ever went to the store with a coupon and they said, oh, that was last week's special. You like, you like smash them and throw them at them. And it's not their fault. It's yours. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Hallelujah. All good. Don't be a part-timer. Don't be a some-timer. Because then you get spiritual Alzheimer. Okay. Yeah, you don't know what's going on. I don't know why me. I don't know how come. Ah, shut up. You know. Please come pray for me. You never come to church eight months and you're like, I come pray for you. What are I going to pray for? You come more often. Because every one of these sermons pertains to you. It helps you along the way. Uh, one of these could have helped you. No, I'm not scolding you. Yes, I am. Shut up. You don't come often. Amen. Everybody in here hears me complain about chairs. Yeah. We just say like, I'm preaching to chairs like last service, right? Wednesday. Everybody disguises chairs for Halloween. And, you know, people say, but I'm there. No, you're not. You're online, you liar. These chairs are for sitting. Not for scanning online. Because if rain outside, you know what you're going to happen? You're going to look outside. Oh, raining again. I make 18 different declarations. You're like, okay, what was that now? You hear a car going down your road on your gravel road. <laughs> oh, what was that? And I just made the most powerful declaration of your entire life and you missed it because a car went down the road. <laughs> but I rewind. Shut up. You don't rewind. You never even used to rewind VHS tapes when you re- <laughs> And you're going to rewind on message for hear me. Yeah, I'm grumbling. Because let me tell you this, boys and girls, I don't have to be in Hilo. I can be any place else with a full packed out house. I choose to be in Hilo. And people choose to not come. Something wrong. One day you're going to come and go, where's Pastor Tim? He moved. What? Where? When he went move? Three years ago. realities guys i don't have to preach in hilo i choose to live in hilo you guys know that right and i know most of you wouldn't even go to church if i wasn't here shut your face and when i hear you not here <laughs> what are you cup of feel make yourself disappear okay back to the notes I, I, you know i scold but you laugh when you go through your stuff no laugh too hard okay all right, where are we? All right, sevenfold. Satan was always the thief. When we catch him, he'll be required to restore seven times as much as what he stole from us. Seven times meaning flipped over, not times seven. Okay, flip it over. Seven. We catch him and, well, let me share this with you. How many of you want to catch the enemy? Yeah, you know you're going to catch the enemy? Read it. 
we catch him by realizing what he's doing to others by our own actions and words. Not what's being done to you, but what you're doing to others. That's how you catch them. Ay, 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 ay. You know why? Because if you're trying to catch the enemy based on what is being done to you, you always have somebody to blame. But if you realize what you're doing, then you realize how conniving and sneaky this bugger is. Because he's doing it through you. Once you catch that, now you have mastered Christianity. Now, again, for the benefit of all of you, I want you to be the most brilliant mind that ever lived in your family tree. Okay? Because mindsets will collapse your tree and it'll bore out from the middle. And you guys have seen trees, right? Sometimes you've got to cut them down because the enemy has eaten from within and the tree falls apart. Again, if you want to catch the enemy at work in your life, it's this right here. Again, we catch the enemy by realizing what he's doing to others by our own, our own actions and words. Because if you're going to defeat the enemy, you have to know him. You have to know him based on what you do and what you have done. If you can say, that person doesn't like me anymore. I hate them. How many know that the enemy wins? Because of them. You know them. They always do that. And then you name them. You claim them. You define them. But you don't realize that the enemy doesn't care about that. You don't get a victory from that. But you will get a victory if you realize what you're doing and saying. Because now you can change it forever. Don't you want forever? I hope this helps some of you right now. We catch this monkey, this devil, this demon spirit by realizing what he's doing to others by us, through us. Okay, you good with that? High five your name and say, amen, I got that. I'm going to be on the lookout for how he's using me. And some of you don't even want to admit, no, the devil, no, 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 no. Pentecostal church will never, ever take full responsibility. No, it's the devil. He can't use me. I'm protected by God. Hallelujah. And as soon as somebody walks in the church, you're already looking at them. Oh, them. That's an action. That's some words. Amen. Oh, look at her. Oh, look at this guy over here. What's up with him? Oh, come on. How is the enemy using you? You don't even realize it. He's so sneaky. He uses you. You don't even know he's using you. Except that you got to go doctor. You got to go proctologist. He's like, oh, I don't know how come. He was just using you as a puppet. Talking for you. Oh, look at them. I used to be fascinated as a little kid watching puppet shows. You guys remember this? And the guys were real good with the stick. And like, and like, and you're like, you don't even see the stick after it. And then as a preacher, I started realizing, everybody walking in like a marionette. All acting like, and then call me later. Wow, shut up. Yeah. But smiling on the phone, yes, praise God. And I'm thinking to myself, what an idiot. Hallelujah. And that's why most of you don't call me because you know I'm making faces on the other side. <laughs> you know, I give you all the answers in here. What answers are you going to hear on the phone that are going to be different from what you hear in here? Maybe you're testing me for see if I'm consistent. Maybe. I don't know. All right. Rejoicing over God's promises moves us into a place of rest. And the rest comes because you realize how the enemy was using you. He's not going to use you anymore. Amen. Understand that for your shame you will have double and for confusion they will rejoice in their portion. They will have everlasting joy. That's Isaiah 61 verse 7. Uh, you can look at this. Take a look. Yeah, Isaiah 61 7. Instead of your shame you shall have and that's the finished work of Christ. You don't have shame anymore. What do you have in its place? Double honor. You guys see that? Hmm. Interesting. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. That's you. Finished work of Christ, you rejoice in what you have. That's called gratitude. Amen. How many of you are grateful for what you have? 
Only when you are grateful for what you have can God bring more. To God, that is satisfaction in him when you're grateful. That's why he can bring more. But if you're, if you're bitching and moaning about you, what you don't have, that's where you're going to stay. Some of you don't like that word? Too bad. That's what you get over here. Amen. Because there's no other way to explain it to you. There is no. If you're not grateful, you won't get promoted. Shut up. I'm going to talk to you real. I talk to you the way I would want to be talked to. And I don't like what I say sometimes, but too bad because they're talking to me, not you. You're just here for the ride. A bus driver is just going down the road. You either on the bus or you get off the bus and catch another one. Amen. This bus says on the front, heavenly places. You guys all want to go to heavenly places? You're ready there because the bus on the side says we are heavenly places. So not only is that our destination, it's the bus company we in. Some of you catch that next Thursday, 4.30. Yeah. All right. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double everlasting joy shall be theirs. So this is a prophetic, again, Old Testament prophetic. So what do you have? All of these things. You have double honor. You rejoice. You're grateful in your portion. You possess double. And you have everlasting joy. Say amen. Some of you looking at me like, when going to show up? When you jump off the top of this building head first, you'll see that you already had it. You possessed it. Right like this. This is the posture you take up high. Pull your hands into prayer. Bend your knees and jump off. And you will see everything you had. You say, shucks, I wish I could go back, but my body all boss. <laughs> Amen. Back to the notes. Hallelujah. We're getting to the end. I hope you enjoy my crude sense of humor. I'm not telling you to kill yourself because most of you are killing yourself all by yourself every day. Amen. You're killing yourself with bad mindsets and thoughts. Okay. God will recompense anyone who has shame. We all have shame, but he will give us a double portion of joy for it to get through and get to. God wants you to have. Realize joy is going to carry you through like, ah. You know what? Every problem you have in this life is always about people. It's 99% people and 1% people. You know what? It's 99% you and 1% them. Not. Yes. Because the common denominator in all these bad relationships is you. What? Was I lying? If I'm lying, I'm flying, but my feet on the ground. Anyway, you all good at that? You let them in. You let them in. So how do you do? Walk away. Well, how are you going to walk away? First, you got to untie. They pin the tail on you, donkey. Take the pin off. Put the tail away. Okay? Okay, people who feel guilty about something admit they need to confess it. Those who feel shameful want to hide it. Or hide what they're ashamed of so no one can see it. And that's how the enemy works. He just wants everybody to be in this place where you can't get out. Amen. All right. God always provides what? Hallelujah. Courts always demand restitution. What is restitution for? It's always to make the victim feel good about himself. Pretty much. And satisfy some expenses that went out so god always provides full restitution he'll make you feel really good about yourself when he brings it all back as a double portion or overflowing vats and your floors your threshing floors are full of wheat i mean no, you're gonna feel very satisfied when everything returns like <laughs> all i had to do was be happy say amen you know the greatest weapon you have against the devil is being happy in spite of I don't know. Some of you not agreeing today. Just looking at me like, <laughs> when the happiness going to start? I already started. Hello, you already have it. It's up to you to exhibit it. Here we go. Times of refreshing always comes from God's presence. He sent Jesus, who was preached to us. God has spoken of restitution through His prophets since the beginning of the world. Here's your New Testament scripture, right? Acts three. Verse 19, 
And here we are, ESC. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Is Jesus the fulfillment of all things? Yes. So what did he not fulfill? Well, you fulfilled everything. It's just your mind is the rock. Your mind is the law, right? You ever been told you get on hard head? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody been told you're hard head? No. And you know, they tell your siblings, right? They tell your siblings, right? Don't be like them. They get hard head. And you're like, what? How come I don't want it to hard head? Because you were the black sheep of your family. Am I right or am I wrong? Look around you. Who was the black sheep? All you. You know why? Because you were wired differently. Amen. Hallelujah. You, you ever walk in a computer store? There's some computers that are $199. And then there's some that are $1,199. And then you look at the middle one, still $700. you are like, Oof. So you start settling in below the halfway point. And then the thing craps out after a year or so. Yeah? It's, that's how God operates, right? Some people are wired for better, better performance. Amen? The higher you go on the spectrum, the more wattage it can handle, the more apps it can handle, the more software it can use. I want you to know that you are wired down here, eleven ninety nine, and you're dealing with $199 people. And you try and find the middle ground with them, and you can't. You know why? Because you're far superior. Not that you're like, oh, yeah. No, it's because you're just wired for more. That's why you're hard hit, because you can handle more than most people. All that will tell you that. Good night. <laughs> you can handle more. Your memory is bigger. That's why the $1,199 computers have way more memory. So you know what happens? Way more stuff is going to happen to you because you're going to remember more. Because you are the minister. This is the people that need ministry. You don't believe me until it's going to happen. People are going to start calling you. Help me. Like, help you. I try for help myself. <laughs> You can help them. You know why? Because you went through way more. You ever caught yourself when somebody comes to you, oh my God, I'm going through all this, and you're thinking to yourself in your mind quietly like, that's it? That's all? And you're surprised that they bring you this manini little problem when your whale shark of a problems were all conquered by you, and you're like, that's it? Praise God, let me pray for you. Like, and you think it is a what prayer I'm going to pray? I'll like slap your head. It's so nothing. <laughs> this whole problem you just brought to me is like one whole big nothing. Okay, and then you put on your brave ministry. For, Praise God. God. Then you get one eye open for see if they're praying because you like slap them if they're not. Like. And Lord, this huge problem they're having. Help them, Lord. Lord, you brought them to it. You'll see them through it. You're making all your Pee Wee Herman faces. You guys all know Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> you pray for this guy. Their eyes are closed. Yes, Lord. Praise God. And you're like, yeah, Lord. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Lord. Satisfy this so long. God, you can do the impossible. <laughs> you gonna have to guard your face in case they open eye and look at you. Like, oh, yes, Lord. And the next thing we're praying. <laughs> you guys already know. You guys went through a multitude of problems that are. In, to you, it's like, yeah, and they come to you. That's why I say I was 750000 in debt to the IRS. Somebody came to me, Pastor, please pray with me. The IRS is going to take my house. I owe three grand. 
I know, just from personal experience, like, can I just help you with this problem? <laughs> Three grand? Are you serious? I can look on the floor of my car and find three grand for your problem. <laughs> well, he's stuck under my seat from old drug day kind of stuff. Hang on. <laughs> Hallelujah. People come to you with the most stupidest stuff. You go through terminal cancer, you get healed of terminal cancer, and they come to you. <laughs> I get the flu. <laughs> Play for me. You're going to die. You will die because I'm gonna kill you right now. Amen. Amen. Let's put on our ministry face. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. Just say those things over and over. That's the greatest prayer you can pray. As you're holding the head. God is good. Praise you, Jesus. Lord bless them. Don't make the WTF with your lips. <laughs> you know what? That authority that you carry is so powerful. Well, based on all what you went through, they come to you. You got to guard yourself. Like, you know what? You know what's really happening? Even though you're making all these faces, it's a declaration of like, this is nothing. God, you got this. I don't even need help on them. They're just so hopeless. That's all. I thought that's the name of your church you go to. Anyway. Yes, we do more ministry to those people, believe it or not, than any other church. Hallelujah. And another church called Heritage or something. I don't know. I cannot even. I can't. So many church names now. They go on the highway. It's called The House. The House? Oh, my God. Not a church, industrial area, change the name, Connecting Point. I remember connecting the points when I wanted to do dot to dot. And the picture still not come out right. Anyway, I'm just saying. All right, back to the notes. Hallelujah, before I get in trouble with every church in Hilo. I love that churches fill the bill for a lot of people, but how many you know that these churches got to get hip to the program of the finished work? It's already done. It was done already. Amen. Hallelujah. Where are we? Ah, oh, we're all good. That's where we are. Nah. Oh, here we are. When we change our focus from feeling we need to be in God's presence to honestly realizing we are already with Him, we are refreshed. How fast? Let that. The definitions of restitution include reparation made by giving the equivalent of what was lost, damaged, injured, a restoration of rights. Previously taken away or surrendered or restoration to the original state or position. This is called the garden dwellers. You're a garden dweller. Amen. Okay. God never forgot what was stolen, lost, or damaged. You know, your family that has passed away, they're in heaven making intercession before God day and night so that you pick up what they lost. They want the best life for you. And you'll be, I don't know. Shut up already. Okay. Just... Job 42.10, I told you I was going to get to it. Here you are. Let's look at Job 42.10. Hallelujah. Look at that, verse 10. You see it? Let's blow it up a little so they can read. All right, verse 10. Eh, close enough. <laughs> For you. <laughs> and the Lord restored Job's losses. When he prayed for his friends, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much. What? And all he had to do was what? But who was Job's problem? His friends. Remember, we went through 40 chapters to realize that he was like going back and forth with these guys. But Job... Had all this loss in chapter 1 and 2. His family, everything he owned. How many know that now God gives him twice as much because he does what? One act of praying for his friends. How many know that you have people who are your problem? Pray for them and watch what happens. 
That's true gratitude. Amen. All right. You guys get it? How many of you want twice as much as you had before? Yeah. Twice. Twice. How many of you lost stuff before? All that will be restored to you sevenfold. Plus you get twice as Man, you are a winner, and you just got to realize it and walk in and winning. Winning is easy because you win before you begin. Okay, back to the notes. We're trying to get through this. I know all of you have places to go. Hallelujah. When Job prayed for his friends, God turns jo- turned Job's captivity and gave him twice as much. Job was only blessed when what? Read it. When he humbled himself and forgave his friends pride stops restoration read that again pride stops restoration when you think you better than somebody you have just stopped your flow remember you're not better than somebody you're just in a better position than somebody okay read it again pride stops restoration your family tree is waiting for you to pick up everything in humility god brings joy to the people when they praise and honor him the voice of joy will be heard when he reverses their captivity here's the thing he reversed your captivity so all you got to do now is operate in joy hallelujah don't even go there all right praising him uh, if you're listening, Jeremiah 33, 9 to 11 is where you need to study. Praising Him even when we don't feel like it is a sacrifice. He will return the joy back into our lives. So what do you got to do? Praise. Praise Him. This is a lot of good strategy. Praise the Lord in all things because that shows Him how grateful you are for where you're at. Whenever the locusts are here doing their thing, all you got to do is say, eh, it's just a little season I got to get through. Say amen, otherwise you're going to struggle through this. Say amen, some of you never. I didn't get an amen out of that section back. All right, man. I'm going to turn into a black preacher any second. Hallelujah, jump on the furniture. Okay. Again, praising, praising him even when we don't feel like it is a sacrifice. Sacrifice that, amen. Your pride, sacrifice your pride. Okay, Nehemiah became angry with the nobles for taking too much money. He demanded the return of what was taken. Now, Nehemiah, if you study this, Nehemiah 5, verses 6 to 12, just study that, and you will see justice in action, okay? Nehemiah declared restoration, which is something many Christians do not do. We're going to do that today. We're going to have you declare restoration so that you can walk in humility and gratitude and praise. And you're going to see everything turn in one day. Your whole life will turn in one day. If, if, if. <laughs> E-E-F. If. If you can shut down your head. We're going to hand out swords. One of these kids have a plastic sword. We're going to do a symbolic. We're going to chop your neck. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. I went to a church one time. They had all the elders with plastic swords. They said, come up here if you need a mindset change. And they were all like, swing, making a sound, swing. Right. <laughs> I was like, this is all cartoons. Then I preached in a the church. They gave me the biggest offering, one of the biggest ones I ever had. I said, this is the greatest church I ever preached in. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Half an hour they only gave me. 30 minutes. You know how? I cannot talk 30 minutes. I'm howly, but I live in Hawaii too long. I, I turned Portuguese. No more Portuguese blood, you know. Just this is hybrid kind. Anyway, well, these guys were literally all the elders had capes on tied up here. And they all held the sword and they said, come up and walk through. And they all went, swing. Next, swing. And I was in the front row, I was like, 30 minutes they gave me to speak. And I was like, oh God. So I had to preach on mindset real fast. Five grand for 30 minutes, not bad. I said, when do I come back? They said, hallelujah. We got the message. They never had me back. The message resonated. Everybody got changed. I was like, I better stop preaching so good. Because evidently in my own church, I preach for two hours and nobody gets it. (laughs) 
I know, get me the swords. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys wear me out. Because I preach two hours. I don't do the swing. You call me and text me all week. And then I got to come. The messages for five years been on mindset. Next service. Swing. I'm going one better. Lightsaber. I'm going to lightsaber hallelujah I'm ready I don't know about you they had a contest they were having lightsaber contest you know what I mean? and all the nerds fighting each other with lightsabers wow we need that in our church you know what I think I've been preaching with lightsabers you know why every time something hits you you disappear I'm going to see you guys for months Maybe not. Okay. All right. So he declared restoration, which is something most Christians don't do. All right. Let the redeemed of God say so who, whom he has delivered from the enemy. All right. Psalm 107 verse 2. If we take a look real fast. This is your last scripture of the day, by the way. Some of you are like, yay. Shut up. I don't know why you were. I'm not going to see you for a while anyway. Okay. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Simply, that's what it says. He has already redeemed you from the hand of the enemy. So it's not the devil, boys and girls. It's you. Once you realize the enemy's devices, again, what we talked about earlier, how he's using you, you will see how all of your relationships change instantly. You know that most people don't deserve your words? Say amen. Your words are too valuable. My policy is love everybody in here while you're here. As soon as you walk out the door, go minister to somebody who no come here. You know what? You start hanging out with people of like faith. What happens is you start getting into a debate and then all of a sudden you're arguing. And then nothing good happens. Go find somebody who don't know this message. That's, this is revelation to them. Okay? In your notes, last statement of the day. The redeemed are the ones who have been restored. We are commanded to speak restoration. Say amen. amen. Are you speaking restoration to yourself? You should because it's available to you. Hallelujah. We're going to stand right now. Everybody stand up. Hallelujah. Everybody good. I know I went long. Too bad. Shut up. Okay. Hallelujah. You don't need to tell me. I